we are such such Melodies and hearts and the mind relax Online credit cards, LOL and caps What you do well with no time relax I'm hustling so hard on my life to rap Baby, you a star coming live direct He's calling cause the heart at the disconnect You know I'm party hard at the disco tech Don't want nobody else, never disrespect you My boo, playing it cool Never check the fellow do some things them do Shadow worship show and prove Coming home tomorrow, get me in the mood I never watch no fears, it's not quite too wide Wrap it to the morning light, boy Don't stop until the sunlight I wanna give you all my love, whoa I love the way you hit the tight I make my dream wanna realize I'm so happy that you stayed Ghostwriting for Dr. Dre, Eminem. I worked at Aftermath, and this rhythm they gave to me and said, "Well, we wanted this was my audition to see whether or not I could rap." So this one's called Warriors, and uh, I just wanted to express that sometimes the written word is just as powerful as force, you know. So it's called Warriors time. Read it. If you like jumping up, shaking out, clapping, do as you wish. trying to overstand the roots and the evolution of Rastafari and what it means to be a Marley today in the context of humanity and what we as individuals can offer in, in this physical existence. And this documentary really helped to shape a lot of my, a lot of my perspectives, but it also helped to open up a lot of my perspectives because coming from Jamaica and being a Rasta in Jamaica, the home of reggae music, it's almost like the world ends there, you know, because it's so full, the experience of Rastafari and reggae music. But like I said, the more I travel, the more I realize that I don't know anything. And there's so much more to know and so many more spirits to encounter and so many more experiences to have and to share you know so it's a little bit about my journey over the past couple of years and i want to open up the space for a few questions or comments while we're here before the night ends nice vibration don't be shy you've been around the whole world with me yes my brother I just like to, yeah, here we go. I'd just like to say that that was a really, really remarkable piece and journey and experience to share with, to open our eyes and our hearts to what is possible and what is inside us and 
it really opens many things for me and I'd just like to thank you from my heart of hearts for taking the journey and taking the time but I knew that it was part of your path so it's quite easy for you. Oh, uh, quite e easy, but Easy you. maybe not, but you had to do it, yeah? Yes, I had, I had to. Thank you very much for, for your words and for being open to receiving what it is you know, that I'm trying to share. Um, it has been easy sometimes, you know, because being Bob Marley's granddaughter, people want to want to know about you and want to know about your family and all this kind of great thing, which is great, but many times people forget my name. <laughs> it's Donisha. <laughs> you know, so I find myself trying to also define myself um, within a day like today when I'm not a musician, I don't sing, I can sing a little bit, but you know, I, I feel like there's so much more work to do in the world and I feel like I have, I have a great voice that can do so much more too, you know? So, yeah, yeah man, just a human being trying to figure out what is going on. <laughs> so give thanks for your words. Anybody else? Yes, my brother. Denisha. Yes, brother. Thank you so much for uh, for bringing this here. Yeah, give thanks. And uh, I have a I have a question. Being uh, being a white man in this time, you know, coming from uh, coming from a country where um, I don't really know where my people came from, you know. Um, when I think about um, you know, you're being of European descent. Um, I think about um, my brain only goes back a couple of years. You know, it goes maybe like 50 years back, and then there's no you know connection for me to my people. You know, where I truly come from, and uh, and I know that's you know how it's been um, before this whole Rasta movement came for the people of Jamaica. You know, and it's super inspiring for someone like me, um, and also it's like to to fully witness it um, and to know that um, that um, you know the people that that I come from are uh, <laughs> many times um, in many instances the oppressor, the downpressor man, you know, and um, and so. It's, it's beautiful because I feel like Rasta movement really sparked something in me personally um, to really like seek my, uh, you know, the, the Marcus Garvey of my time and my, you know, my people and where that comes from. And uh, it's a place where people really take on this superficial aspect, but particularly because it's so popular, the music is, is universal what's being spoken to, and particularly the, the, the songs of One Love and No Woman No Cry. Um, they're universally accepted, and Bali has become a tourist destination, so a lot of people utilize that energy to you know, get some income and feed their families. And um, that's an unfortunate side. Uh, on positive side, it still does bring people together. You know, and there are folks who still, you know, they aspire to that, that ideal of having folks have a good time and come together. Uh, in relation to, or well, in comparison, I would say, from Bali to, say, West Papua, right? So if you go to West Papua, where you have people who you would like, reggae music is the most popular music in West Papua, and those are black people in this region of the planet. And uh, the rebels, the people who are fighting for independence, they're all wear locks. They all listen to reggae music. They utilize that more than just the superficial aspect of just, you know, we, we come together, have fun. They understand what Bob Marley is talking about. I utilize that as a means for them to to deal with they deal with here with the oppression in their in their land. So that's one thing that's happening. I'm not sure. Are you are you familiar with what's popular? I am. So it's interesting that you're talking about it because it's something that I want to learn some more about while I'm actually here in Indonesia. Yeah. This. Uh, <laughs> We can speak more a little bit more later on. I'm yeah, going we'll there speak band, you know. about it. But yeah, so I just wanted to make that point where, uh, and I see it also in Thailand. I've gone to other regions in this, uh, other areas in this region where there's a lot of reggae music, and it tends to be. And I'm not saying everybody because I'm sure wherever there is rasa, there's going to be at least a few people who are really trying to dive into it. But for the the most most part, it's a commercial thing. Yeah, true. Yes, my brother. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add to what the gentleman was saying. I, I grew up in Indonesia, I've been here for about 30 years. Your grandpa is definitely a symbol of resistance in this country, right? Any group you find, I'm talking from like up in Aceh, which has experienced about 50 years of conflict, all the way down to the far eastern side of Indonesia in West Papua. Though you'll find there's a constant images of your grandfather, the music, it all resonates with the idea of resisting oppression, resisting the idea that a state can tell you who you are and how you should be. So just sort of building on a little bit of what the gentleman was saying. This is a different question. I just want to know the beginning of reggae, how it started. Uh, the beginning of reggae, how did it start? Um, at the end of the film, I introduced a place called Pinnacle. Pinnacle, which is the birthplace of the movement. In 1932, a man named Leonard Howell, who was a colleague of Marcus Garvey and had traveled the world, came to Jamaica when he was deported from America. And he came to Jamaica and he bought 500 acres of land, which was unheard of at that time because black people just didn't have land in Jamaica. We, there were, and we didn't have money. But he came with money. He bought this land and then he started to move across the island to the different plantations to let them know that, listen, we're free. There's a king who has been crowned in Ethiopia who recognizes all the children who have ever been scattered as, he, as the descendants of Africa. We have a home. We do not need to subscribe to these Babylonian concepts. So let us move from these plantations into the mountains to find ourselves, to create our culture, to define our identity. And that's exactly what we did for 16 years at Pinnacle. We were fully self-sufficient based off of the farming of ganja and agriculture that we would sell back to the Indians because the Indian indentured laborers were the only ones who were making money at that time. And they were also the ones who brought the ganja seed and the whole concept of even being vegetarian in an island where all we, we got to eat were what was left over from, from the, the table of our masters. You know, the pig foot and the, the, the chicken, the, the chitlings and chicken feet and all of this kind of thing. Now we were gaining knowledge about you don't have to kill to live. Those, those are Hindu principles. Even the dreadlocks like we spoke about. These, these, these images come also from the holy men in India, the sadhus who live way up in the mountains. You know, so there's so many, there's so many instances of cultural